Some general considerations on the philosophy and practice of magic now follow. The effectiveness of magic depends heavily on the skill and subtlety of those performing it and on the careful choice of and preparation for a desired effect. In general, one should try and bring about events which have a measurable probability of occurring by chance alone. And one should not be too proud to do everything possible on the physical plane to help it occur. Thus, magic should be something thrown in to tip the scales of chance in one's favor when all possible physical action has been taken. By neglecting to maximize the probability on the physical plane, one sets up an internal conflict in which magic is expected to make up for poor preparation. Thus, in divination, one should not shy away from first exhausting all mundane sources of information that might be relevant, and in enchantment, assist the spell both before and after casting by all possible ordinary means. The purpose of performing magic is not to test the efficacy of magic. If it is performed in this spirit of challenge, the subconscious challenge for it to fail will be the only result which manifests. Magic is to be performed to get results, and even if one at first achieves results only a little better than chance, then it at least provides an edge which can be turned into a considerable advantage if subtly employed. One should always look for an avenue of reasonable probability through which chance can be bent towards desire. For example, the probability of spontaneously materializing a substantial fortune is rather low. And even doubling that probability by magic is unlikely to lead to success. On the other hand, even a small advantage in gambling or business can produce a decisive effect. Similarly, divination should be regarded as a means of distinguishing the correct information from amongst those alternatives of which one is aware or able to imagine. In magical acts of illumination, it is better to conjure initially for modest, specific improvements or even arbitrary changes to oneself rather than for ill-defined or grandiose modifications. Although the law of magic is peppered with tales of really extreme and improbable events, remember that even the best of the magi rarely pull off more than a dozen such events in a lifetime. The aspiring magician should seek to work on the simpler schemes first and to immerse himself in the belief structures of magic and the really great acts of power will gradually begin to manifest in his work. At any time in life, but most commonly in late youth, when we have the vague intuition that, is, that there is something profoundly bizarre and inconsistent about life, the universe and everything, there may suddenly be a horrifying or ecstatic certainty that one's own self is illusory and that reality is also an illusion. One's carefully defended identity seems to be a pointless pretense and an empty shell. The world becomes a cacophony of meaningless sensations. Most people will reject this initiation and manage to fill their lives and identities with sufficient concerns until perhaps an awareness of mortality reminds them of it again. Those who do drink the poison must seek stronger medicine or become sick or mad. Rational materialism is the least powerful of the antidotes. Little more than an assertion of the reality of the ego or self-image and the reality of physical objects. Yet it works for some and if they pursue it rigorously, they may become that much more effective in philosophy and science for the serpent's kiss. However, it does impart a veiled destructiveness to these endeavors. Religion and mysticism offer a different form of medicine. Transcendentalism is the acceptance of the emptiness of self and the unreality of phenomena as symptoms of our temporary estrangement from some greater fullness and reality be it nirvana, God, or enlightenment. Those with a particularly te deep terror of extinction and nothingness become the most passionately religious and mystical, precisely because that negation is always with them. Finally, 
There are those brought close to death by the serpent's bite, and those who found in the poison itself a source of freedom and laughter. These are the potential magicians. Debilitating and depressive maladies with no obvious cause were recognized as a shaman sickness in the old hunter-gatherer societies. If the sufferer could rebuild his identity or spirits, and hence his bodily health, with or without help from other shamans, then he could become a shaman himself. In our own culture, there is too much symptom suppressive medicine, and there are too many subcultural identities available for this tradition to have survived. However, there are many who do become magicians after a struggle with illness, typically asthma, or after a struggle with the temptations of suicide. For some candidates, the serpent's bite is an ecstatic awakening, and they proceed directly to a purely magical answer without suffering. If the self is an elaborate pretense and the world is without a fixed meaning, then one is free to be anybody and do anything. Such freedoms equip one well for the theatre or espionage, or if one has a taste for tampering with the fabric of illusion itself, magic. After the absurdity and eventual collapse of their empire and class system, the British have often only the most tenuous grip on any kind of credible identity. And it is unsurprising that such a high proportion of notable spies, actors, and magicians should emerge from that race. Of course, there are many people who look to magic merely as a means of augmenting their lifestyle whilst retaining an essentially materialist or transcendental worldview. The materialist who dabbles in the occult is usually looking for something transcendental. He never finds it because no proof or refutation of parapsychology really implies anything at all about the existence or non-existence of anything transcendental. Transcendentalists who dabble in magic usually obtain results as spectacular as they are useless. Quite quickly they are surrounded by demons and spirits, powers and principalities, and notebooks full of outlandish visions and communications. Soon they are alternating between excessive humility and megalomania. Those who approach magic from a, a materialist or transcendental point of view may succeed in getting a few magical effects, but only an acceptance of magic on its own terms is likely to confer the persistence to actually become a magician. Thus it is worth contrasting the magical paradigm with the rational and transcendental paradigms to see how they might usefully be untangled from each other. Although the paradigms are not mutually exclusive, they do not fit comfortably together. Yet of all people, the magician is the least likely to feel that they should be forced to fit, and the contemporary magician has most to profit from a working understanding of each. The materialist, transcendental, and magical paradigms each recognize a different basis to reality. The materialist universe consists of matter and energy in space and time. The transcendentalist universe is created of spirit or consciousness. As there is no universally accepted word for the underlying reality of the universe in magical terms, I shall borrow and adapt the word mana. All magical systems are explicitly or implicitly structured around the recognition of mana in some guise or other. Mana cannot precisely be described in materialistic or transcendental terms. But as magical terms are rather limited in our culture, it is worth attempting these descriptions. Mana, in materialistic terms, is the information which structures matter and which all matter and thought is capable of emitting and receiving across space and perhaps time. Mana, in transcendental terms, is a sort of life force present to some degree in all beings, objects and events, and able to act between them. In magical terms, mana is the power which shapes phenomena, and which phenomena emit to shape other phenomena. It is also knowledge in the sense that the shaping power imparts information. Mana is not synonymous with consciousness in the transcendental sense. 